good to start. Okay. Wonderful. Well, first of all, welcome everybody to this webinar tonight on uh, June twenty second. Uh, this is our presentation, or basically, we will present our results from our project or research uh, project about redefining HR in a post COVID era. This research uh, and presentation will be presented by IUM students, uh, luxury students uh, from the Univers University of uh, Monaco. A short introduction to this project is that it started uh, in February or March this year during the uh, COVID craziness of this year. Uh, so we started in the lockdown and now we are sort of getting out of the lockdown, but so our perspectives and our findings are found within the lockdown uh, time. Just some short notes before we start. Uh, first, we will have a presentation, which will last maybe about 20 minutes, and then it will be followed up by a Q&A session. And we want you maybe guys to save the questions until the Q&A session, uh, and you will have two options to address your questions. You can either write to us via the Q&A uh, option, in Zoom, which you will find at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your virtual hand uh, and we will give you permission to speak up and uh, speak your or ask your questions. So with those things set in place, I think we are good to, to start this journey. There we go. So we will start off with this very, very interesting and actually very much saying quote. It's very hard to find top talent. People aren't necessarily running to hospitality as a first choice anymore. Now, this is related to that we had uh, an interview or a person uh, and people that were within the hospitality industry before COVID, uh, it's very, they're very resistant to come back. Uh, and maybe some of these issues uh, or why will also be revealed in this uh, research. Many of the people that were working before COVID uh, now have transitioned into maybe banking, healthcare, uh, maybe call centers where they can use their uh, skills, uh, these, these uh, service skills towards people. The agenda for today, we will start off with just a short introduction of who we are uh, and uh, which partners have been part of this uh, research. Then we'll look at the mission and objective and design thinking and methodology of our research project. Then, of course, we'll dig into the more interesting part of the interview and survey focus uh, and some food for thoughts. And of course, also we'll come with some uh, recommendations. Looking at firstly who we are. So we are master students from the International University of Monaco, which is an English language uh, thought business program. Around 600 students with more than 80 nationalities uh, attend Monaco uh, almost daily. And of course, the university offers both a BBA, uh, master's, MBA, DBA, and doctoral programs. Specifically for this research project, we have been six, 16 students in the luxury hospitality and event management specialty. Uh, and just within our team, we come from nine nationalities. So we have been able to have a very diversified uh, approach to this research. Before we dig into the research, we also want to give a big thank you to the people that have been the part of this project. First of all, the Vitruvius Partners Groups, uh, which have assisted us with uh, knowledge, with people, uh, and with guidance along the way. Of course, our professor, Bertrand Petit, uh, and Lilian Bougie, who are co-founders and managing directors also at the Vitruvius Partners uh, Group. Lastly, also to the, all the amazing uh, university professors, at our university that have been able to give their insights and uh, helped us along the way. Dermot. Thank you, Peter. So uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm now going to look at, uh, I suppose, introducing our, our two main experts tonight. Um, Bertrand Petit, our, our professor, who has done a great job with us, if I may say so myself, uh, Chief, Chief Executive Officer, Cruise and Hotel Industry, Sea level executive and expert um, and has been uh, an incredible experience to be in his class this year. We're also joined, joined by the fantastic Heidi Breitenmoser, 
who I had the pleasure of interviewing myself as part of our research. And uh, I tell you, she, she is an amazing woman with fantastic energy and um, definitely somebody that I, I know has added so much to our presentation. And I'm, I'm very, very uh, thankful for her giving up her time. Uh, she's been so generous already and, and she continues to give. So thank you very much, Heidi, as well, uh, for being here tonight. Um, and with uh, further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand the microphone to Mr. Bertrand Petit, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dermot, and thank you for this introduction. Thank you, Peter. And um, guys, um, I want to, well, thank you also. Uh, we've spent uh, three semesters together. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, to the audience, I must say that this class uh, was absolutely outstanding. These are people that uh, are passionate about uh, their learning experience. And I think you'll see uh, tonight the result of their work. Uh, we, how, how did it work? We wanted to, to find a topic uh, together and actually the students chose a topic, which is, you know, I, I sort of came with a blank sheet and say, okay, guys, we're gonna, we, we have to work on, 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 a, on a relevant topic. What would it be? You know, what would you like it to be? And they came with this topic, which obviously I think is highly, highly relevant. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot from, from them today. The reason why I teach at the university is because, frankly, uh, I, I learn. For me, it's a learning experience. You know, yes, you can say, as Dermot say, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm an expert. I don't think so, but you're never an expert, really. You know, you always learn. And for me, being at the university, being in front of these students, it is such a positive challenge. It, it challenges you in a way that even being a CEO doesn't challenge you. You know, I was talking actually uh, today for lunch uh, to, to Jean-Philippe Muller, the, the dean of the IUM, and I told him exactly that. You know, the, 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 you spend three hours in a, in a meeting with corporate executives, you're okay. You spend three hours teaching a class at the IUM, you're, you're excited. You know, you, you're tired, but you're excited. They challenge you, and I learned so much. So thank you, guys. You've made this year an amazing year for me. I will remember it for a long time, and I say that truthfully. And I'm really, really looking forward to to this uh, to this presentation today. I haven't seen it, so it's going to be a surprise for me as well. But I know that you guys will do an amazing job. Thank you to Heidi as well, uh, as you said, Dermot. Heidi, uh, Heidi, and I know each other. We've worked uh, way past when <laughs> on ships together. But I'm also extremely impressed with what Heidi uh, Heidi left the cruise industry. And, and develop this recruitment and talent management entity in North America. And we immediately reconnected and felt that we belong together in a sense. We have shared values. I absolutely love the innovative approach that Heidi has on talent management and on recruitment. So thank you, Heidi. I'd like also to thank uh, my colleague and my friend, Lilian Bougie, uh, who is the managing partner of Vitreviews Partners Group. And, and without, without Lilian, well, that reviews wouldn't exist, to be honest, and, and, and I, I must thank him for this. And also Lilian was instrumental in guiding the, the, uh, the students on, on this project. So thank you, Lilian, as well. ID, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dermont, uh, Bertrand, for this very warm welcome. I feel so blessed to be here today with you. Thank you again, Bertrand, for having me and for including me in this research and project. Um, we are very honored and thankful. I had to, the pleasure to be interviewed by Dermont a couple of weeks ago. Um, he, of course, did his research with uh, the fellow students, as mentioned, around rethinking HR. And I was truly imp impressed with the level of engagement, high level of engagement, and the questions asked. So I'm very curious to see the outcome of this research. And as Bertrand mentioned, uh, I want to share with you a little bit more about WIPS before we dive in and hear everything they researched. Um, I'm the co-owner here at WIPS, and WIPS is a boutique recruitment agency, and I joined in 2017, followed by an inner calling to impact the hospitality industry positively and to really help people to step up. It was time, in my opinion, my humble opinion, to elevate the game and accelerate the recruitment process. We integrated video resume as a signature item, two minutes video showcasing 
the interviewer or the candidate in an interview scene where they answer two key questions around value and the interest for the actual um, position to highlight their values and personality. Because think about it, the company's culture is driven by the employee's value. So people lie at the core and heart of the hospitality industry. People serving from the heart who create very long lasting, impactful and meaningful experiences. We believe it's time to first put the spotlight on the human aspect when hiring. To look at each story, because we all have one, isn't it? And um, let's highlight the talent and the potential first. And we can do this beautifully through video resume. Also, we all have a shorter attention span. You know, viewers retain 95% of the message when they watch a video compared to 10% when they're actually uh, reading, you know, reading in a text. And 86% in a research, people have said that they would like to see more videos from brands. So we said we should definitely integrate video resume because we are a recruitment agency. We go even further and say that in the future, these endless job postings will fade away. And predominantly, it will be about meaningful relationships you have built. So start today. You are your own brand. So really owning that means become comfortable in front of the video and start and learn how to engage online and of course offline too. And make sure it's authentic and coherent. Furthermore, we take a very holistic approach to the relationship building part, the blissful cycle of recruitment as we call it, because I'm also a certified yoga teacher. And I highlight the balance between being and doing. How can we achieve this work-life balance that we all talk about? And how can we unlock our potential? Holistic approach, I said, to round things up, it looks, let's look at the word, it comes from holy, right? To become whole again, to align body, mind, and spirit, so that we all can contribute to a harmonious work environment, because workplace wellness starts with each one of us. Rosewood, for example, is using different titles now for HR, did you know? Like Chief Talent and Culture Officer. So they highlight also the employee stories and it's all on the foundation of their higher purpose and inner calling. Last but not least, we live in a constant state of evolution and it's crucial we take the time and do research and ask the right questions like you did, Dermo, and uh, dear fellow students. Listen and include the new generation and stay on top of all the trends. Only through evolution, we can sustain greatness and significance. Thank you so much, Bertrand and Dermo, and uh, we can't wait to hear this great presentation now that it will be followed now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. I, I just, I love your energy and your passion. You have just so much to give and, and anybody that's watching, please follow this lady. She, she really is a, a driving force. Uh, we, we had a great chat, Heidi, and, and a lot of the subjects that you just touched on there, we, we, we really dug into and, and they're just so powerfully relevant at the moment. Um, and COVID has exposed a, a lot of, of the needs that, um, that we, we hope to address inside in this report. And, and uh, let's, let's get stuck in. Thank you, Peter. So to start it off, uh, Heidi, I could, have put, I could have written a book on all the, the, the quotes that you gave me, but I, I'm going to just take one and, and share it with everybody because I, I think it's, it's incredibly important. Uh, you, you've touched on it there. Um, and when you said, I think that companies that would be very successful are the ones that are going to be able to present a very diverse, creative and great wellness program. And, and that's what it is. You spoke about it there when you mentioned that holistic approach and it has got to be holistic. And I think employees post COVID have changed and they, they have different demands. And, and we're going to look at, at everything now from, uh, from our research. Thank you, Peter. So our mission and objectives. I suppose from the origins of, of our research from when we were in that class and we were trying to figure out how, how we were gonna put this all together and, and try and make it relevant and, and make it something that we could stand over and, and something that the industry would appreciate. And, um, you know, we're in a very unique period in the sense that this year we were in lockdown 
uh, in and out of it, but mostly in lockdown. And COVID has has destroyed this industry and put everything on ice. And and but by the time we've come to the end of this course, things have began to open up. Um, the markets are, are re-emerging. Um, restaurants and hotels are, are slowly opening. Cruise ships are coming back. Um, so I suppose we, we looked at it from the two sides of it and, and just that, that transgression from the mission. So, you know, we wanted to get a thorough understanding of the past, the current state of HR and hospitality. Uh, we combined it with interviews with industry experts uh, to understand where, where exactly this is going to go and what needed to be said, what needed to be done, what practices need to be, to be changed and, and altered. And ultimately, so what were, what were our objectives? We wanted to make human resources a more sensitive, people-focused and empathetic organization. After all, it, it's a people industry. And Heidi, you spoke about it so often that it, it, it is, it's the people that matter. Uh, it's a people business. And we need that emotional intelligence, most emotional quadrant, quotient uh, mindset, which is required for future success. So when we look at, we, we, we did a, a huge uh, literature review and, and as students, uh, it's something that, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the first step. We, you know, we, 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 we take the type, we take the project and we go backwards and we say, all right, where is this, where is the industry at the moment? Uh, in order to, to go forward, we need to go backwards first and just to analyze what is out there, what has been studied, what has been preached and, and then bring it forward. And, and if you look at some of the stats, uh, the leisure and tourism industry um, it consists of, of over 10% of global GDP. So that's one in 10 jobs. So you could imagine that the impact that the COVID-19 has had on this industry and, and on families uh, throughout the world, um, it's been a severe challenge. Uh, and some, industry, some hotels, uh, even when they were still open, you take the Marriott, for example, even when they were still open, they were, their occupancy rates were, were down uh, 75%. Um, so it, it just goes to show you the, the depth of the damage that has been done and the pain that has been caused across the world. Hotel workers have been, have been furloughed, they've been let go. Some countries have social security, others do not. Um, benefits, uh, some, some received benefits, others, others scrambled uh, to survive this last few years and, and you know, forced into other industries. Uh, and overall expected losses were over 22 billion US dollars with 50 million jobs cut out in, in the, in the 20, worldwide in 2020. So it just gives you the impact of, of this, this virus uh, that it has caused on the industry globally. So I'm now going to just pass you on to Ravati, who's going to take it to the next level. Hello, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Perfect, go ahead. Excellent. So my name is uh, Revati or, or Rev, and I would like to talk to you about our methodology, um, which Dermot has just mentioned a bit, the current state. So our literature review really focused on um, what has happened in the past, so academic literature, what is in the current news, um, and then just beta, uh, data from you know, World Tourism Organization, Statista, et cetera. So we looked at well over 40 um, documents, which we can share with you in our larger report. Now, the second point of our methodology was uh, a fairly new concept, uh, design thinking. So this is usually used in the, in the tech space, so beta testing for apps, whatnot. We thought we could try it for this project. Uh, the idea being from, um, from brainstorming and ideation to incorporating the whole team, see how people work, um, and then test to see if our ideas make sense, prototype, and then deliver. Now, since this is a report, um, our only sort of prototype was the survey. Um, so in terms of design thinking, we're not fully there yet, but we did try it as a project and we spent several weeks um, really focusing on each of its components because as a class going forward, uh, regardless of the industry that we end up in, it is going to be part of the way that we think. Um, and it's a different, more human way of collective um, coming together for an idea. So we group this with a fairly new concept, well, not too new, but a project management tool called Asana, 
which is where we were able to really assign roles and keep track of who's doing what and how to share information so that nothing gets lost. Um, that's often very difficult when you have a team of 16 people. Moving forward, we conducted one-on-one -on -one executive interviews with 22 people, uh, 22 industry executives, uh, global hospitality leaders from around the world. Uh, we are very thankful for them. And in total, we have over 200 hours of uh, audio recordings. Again, happy to share them, uh, but hopefully they'll be in a concise uh, report format, um, which we'll be sharing later. Along with this, we wanted to conduct an online survey, not at the leadership level, but at the employee level to really understand how are staff feeling throughout COVID? What do they hope to learn for in the future? What do they want in terms of training, wellness? Do they feel like they are being, being treated well? Uh, technology, what have they learned? Um, there will be a link for you to all hopefully take the survey. Uh, if you are working in the hotel industry, share it with your team. Um, we hope that it's helpful uh, and will give you kind of a, a real pulse on, on how your team's feeling. So that's our methodology. Now I'll walk through each one. Dermot has already talked about the literature review. We'll focus more on design thinking now. So design thinking is a, uh, is a way to start with a question um, and it is a human-centered approach that really is brainstorming what we used to do back in the day by putting post-it notes on the board, organizing them, see what made sense in the hopes of coming up with uh, a cohesive idea or project. Um, so it's part what the team wants and, uh, and mixing it with uh, what customers need. Um, that follows prototyping um, and then testing. So in the tech world, that saves a lot of time and money rather than creating something, then realizing that it doesn't work. So the main five points of design thinking are uh, empathy, defining the problem, ideation, the prototype, and finally the testing. Yep. Sorry, Peter has control. Now we come to the interviews. We conducted 22 individual, uh, individual interviews. Uh, we had um, a large part of our team conduct them, whether or not they were in English or French, from people really around the world, from Australia to, um, to North America. And we focused on seven main components. So while it was an open-ended uh, interview, we did have buckets of, of questions that we wanted to focus on. Uh, the first being health and mental well-being. So this clearly was a big issue during the pandemic. So how did staff feel? And more importantly, what can be done in the future? Our second was hiring and training. So again, um, the approach to hiring, especially in hospitality, will no doubt have to change just based on new skill sets. So what will they be and how can training be changed to both attract new employees and retain current good ones? The third, um, similar, was staff poaching and retention. And I think this was one of the quotes at the very beginning about um, how during COVID, you had a lot of people look elsewhere, uh, specifically banking, healthcare, um, even jobs like Amazon, where these are really client-facing jobs, which is the heart of hospitality. So how can hotels incentivize them to return? The fourth question was performance appraisals. This is something that will really have to change so that employees can feel more empowered. They're not just being judged on metrics, but really on um, how they are as people, as humans. So the fifth part is technology. As we all know, we've been living on Zoom, uh, Zoom, Teams, WhatsApp, iPhone, <laughs> you name it. And hotels have had to adapt, but so have employees. And whether that's a weekly check-in just to see, hey, how are you doing? Or to conduct business, um, these are things that will have to be incorporated in the hospitality industry in some capacity in the future. Sixth, we, look at, we looked at regulations. So um, these are mainly health regulations. So there are some things that will have to be adapted uh, post-COVID for perhaps indefinitely. It's also, to some degree at a geographic level, 
we're dealing with hotels that are chain hotels globally. So they have to identify, they have to respect their geographic regulations. And sometimes that's very different as we've seen um, with COVID and furloughed staff. Uh, finally, the similar geography. Different regions have been greatly impacted by COVID. Um, and as hotel chains, how do you tailor your response? So I'll add just a very short example where um, we interviewed someone in Colombia and the only thing, there is no social welfare system there. So what he could do to help his staff is make sure that they were provided with rice and beans and whatever they needed on a weekly basis to, to get by. So a complete list of, um, of the full analyses will be in, in the report. But again, we just wanted to give you an overview. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> so then finally, we come to our survey. Now, our survey was largely based on the seven different buckets that we conducted our interviews with. We just tried to keep it um, not open-ended like the interviews, but more yes, no, and on a scale of one to seven, least likely, most likely, how would people respond? So we did only get 56 respondents, which based on the responses, we did have enough to, to, to provide a fairly solid analysis. Um, if you want to try it, we'll be sending the PDF version of this presentation after. So if you click on the want to try it, I would love to hear more responses. Um, and then finally, our overall analysis did show um, a change in management and wellness is, is what most people really do want. So now our last couple of slides, because I don't wanna to run too short on, on time, um, is I will talk about the survey snapshot first and then the interview and overall recommendations later. Survey snap, snapshot. So our demographic was largely uh, fairly young, 18 and 25, um, crossed between executive and assistant level positions. Most were, and this is no surprise, uh, coming from Europe, mainly France and Monaco, with uh, about 25% coming from North and South America uh, and some from Asia. Now the majority of the responses, uh, the weakest responses was that health and mental wellness uh, had the lowest scores and people were lacking uh, advice both at home, like just professionally, and then taking what's happening at home to work. Training was very interesting. So in terms of, we expected that tech, more tech training would be it, but actually the training, the responses were more about social interaction, how they can work with their colleagues, their teammates, both in work and outside of the workspace without any sort of, again, you know, we're all very different where we come from. So without um, offending any personal space, it's really how to learn soft skills and, and greater EQ, uh, both with coworkers and with guests, because we have to remember that whatever role you are in a hotel, you are always going to be or should be expected to be guest facing. Um, technology, this was, uh, most people did use COVID as a time to learn the basic tech, like we mentioned, how to stay in touch, but people did also use this time to learn new skills in the tech space, new skills that may mean that they could be poached in other industries that are hiring. And that's something that HR and hotels should be cognizant of in the future. Um, and then finally, cross-department learning. So this is where um, skills, uh, I think maybe hospitality is maybe slightly antiquated where you're, you're hired to, and you're trained to perform a certain skill, but employees would actually like to learn cross-department skills. So maybe they can start moving elsewhere. And I think a revamp, we think a revamped performance appraisal process could be a good way to identify where talent might be misaligned or underutilized. So next slide. And so to almost conclude, these are our recommendations in a snapshot. So the first, as you can guess, is mental well-being. So COVID has clearly uh, exposed a huge gap, uh, not just in hospitality, but across industries in um, health and wellness. 
whether it is therapy, whether it is yoga, whether it is meditation, there is a need to implement both in-house um, and working with insurers to provide that to, to ensure that people who don't have access to it can do it at home or in their free time. And um, I think this will undoubtedly lead to a lot more trust. The second is empowerment and mindset change. So staff at all levels should be empowered. And this comes, um, this is actually a quote from, uh, from the Four Seasons in core programming. So focus on three things, connection to people, place, craftsmanship and character. I guess that's, that's four, sorry. Um, the third and one of the most important recommendations is one-on-one -on -one frequent pulse check. Now, hotels have hundreds of staff members, so it is impossible for the GM to be speaking with everyone on a daily basis. But if you can start with your immediate supervisor, and then on a weekly, bi-weekly level, have that supervisor, have a collective group. Then once a month, once a quarter, you have the GM speak. I think that relationship, even if it's simply a, how are you, how is your family, um, makes a really big difference. If you can know their significant other or their child's name, um, that goes very, very far. And again, this is not just in hospitality, but I think as a uh, human-centric industry, it matters a lot more. And then finally, freedom in hiring. I think, um, and this, and, and again, this Heidi goes to a little bit about what you were saying in the video. I should have included that because it's, it's great. Um, but we shouldn't just be hiring people because of their skill set, but because they really want to be part of the team. Um, they're not just working for the sake of a paycheck. Uh, if they are, there are a myriad of other industries that they can join, but hospitality requires, on, requires emotional quotient and soft skills. And in the hiring process, this is where it can be totally remade. So the video is one thing. I think role play is another. I think shadowing someone for a day, depending on that group, that could be another option. But really, it is, it's, it, it's, it, it is really reinventing the hiring process. So that was a lot in one slide. Um, you can move to the next slide. And um, this is from uh, Andrew DeBrito, who's a, a general manager and regional VP at the Four Seasons. And I think this quote is just uh, uh, incredibly relevant. Leadership mindset needs to shift. So it's a leadership mindset that should shift. I don't blame a lot of leaders because many of us leaders grew up with the school of management of 30 to 50 years ago. And that was created during the era of industrialization. So the whole structure was very different. I'm not saying he's old, he's not by any means, but when he was in his formative hospital years of training, that is the way it was trained. So leadership starts, I hate to say top down, but in some cases that is what it takes. And then the next slide. <laughs> I think this is maybe, <laughs> Maybe from your photo, your model shoot today, Bertrand. My, my new, my new car. I found my new car today. This is <laughs> this is so cool. I want to drive that. <laughs> so I just wanted to leave because we we've, we've gone through a lot of information in a short period of time. We'll be following up with all of you with the uh, with the complete report as well as references. But these are some questions that um, that came up in some of the interviews and. I thought if we do have a few minutes left, I'd love to hear it. First, this is a question like we talk about inclusion. How do you actually create inclusion? How can staff really feel like they belong to a team? Um, this is a quote, I win when the team wins. How can you make that everybody you work with mantra? Um, another, we then a me. This is kind of the similar, there's no I in team, so it's a bit cheesy, but still, the point is still there. Um, change performance reviews from metrics versus focusing on, did you hit this? Did you hit that? Your target was 80% off. The question should be, did I do the right thing today? Am I consistently learning? Mm -hmm. And um, again, a, a very small example before the last thing is, um, and I mentioned this to the team is, 
during COVID, there was an incident where uh, an employee went out, partied, um, you know, came back, infected his team, and he wasn't reprimanded. But the process is more sit down and say, did you think that you did the right thing? And if they're an honest person, they're going to say, no, I messed up. Teach me how do I can be better. And I think that that's the approach. Um, and then finally, uh, does my voice matter? And if not, how can we make it matter? So there's one more slide. And that's it. So thank you all. And uh, now, uh, if we do have some time, I would love to um, open it up to any questions. And Hello, maybe our, before, yeah. before we do before we do questions, and I, I, I think we, we may have a few questions. And we welcome that. First of all, I'd like to, I haven't seen the presentation before. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you guys uh, and the, the whole team, this um, very high quality, uh, very well uh, delivered. And, and I like the fact that, you know, at the end we come with answers, you know, with questions rather than answers, right? Because that's how you stimulate people. I think, you know, I learned a lot personally through your presentation. There were elements, you know, frankly, I learned. And I, and I think, you know, when I say, uh, that's why I'm not an expert, Dermot, you know, I learn every day and I learn from you guys. And I did learn a lot today. So thank you for this. And, and I'm, I'm extremely, and I need to state it, I'm extremely proud of the work you've done. I know it was really hard work. Um, and you know, when you work in a team of 16, you have people that do the, the load of work. You have people that don't do the load of work. It's the same in business, you know, and I think it's a, it's an opportunity for you to learn, you know, that well, it will be that way in business. But you guys pulled it together in an extremely challenging environment because I know you had a lot of projects together uh, almost at the same time. And for you to deliver such a high level uh, quality um, report, presentation and report, because of course the report is available for, for anybody who wants it. Okay. Guys, I'm extremely proud of you. You are the future of this industry. Uh, and, and when I see that, the only thing I can say is it's gonna be a very bright future. So really congratulations and you really make me proud. So we can open to, to questions now. Yes, and maybe just a quick note. If you have questions, you can either send it by chat or through the Q&A uh, options on Zoom, or you simply just raise your virtual hand and then we will give you permission to to speak up and and address your question. So please. Maybe, can, can you, I'll start, I have a question, but can you can you go back on the previous slide for one minute? I'll start, if, 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 if you don't mind, I'll start with a question. But it was on your on um, yeah very good. It's not because of the car, cool car. <laughs> okay, but I, I like I like uh, your final food for thoughts. Um, are those um, food for thoughts that you gathered from your interviews, or it things that you you sort of gathered you 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 gathered from your own perspective on things? Does it come from the people that you interviewed? Who are experts or does it come from your analysis your your report your work so a lot of them so the first um the first question how do you how do you really create inclusion did come the first and um the second to last came from uh from andrew four seasons because this is something where he has he's putting everything in place and yes, and, and this is Four Seasons in Tokyo. So you're also talking about a big um, cultural dynamic. So how do you create inclusion is a question he hasn't yet been able to answer. Now for the second to last, the change performance reviews, they've scrapped performance. They have four questions that they ask. Um, I have uh, the, 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 the name of the term um, that I, I can share but it really is about uh, the individual and how are they contributing and how are they interacting with their peers and their, and their management. And I think these are questions, how do you create inclusion? That's not just in, I, I mean, to be honest, this isn't, this isn't just an issue with hospitality. It's an issue that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether we're in school, 
whether we're moving to a new city. Um, and, and I, I think it's, uh, it's a subject, it could be a thesis in its own right. Um, now, the other questions, uh, we did come up together uh, because um, belonging to a no, team, yeah. I think this is something that we learned just doing this project is, you know, at, at IUM, just uh, very, I don't know if we're still recording, yes, we are, um, but we have a, <laughs> We have so many different teams, right? And so at, at times it is hard to feel belonging to a certain entity. And maybe that will change when you join an organization. But even within that organization, you have multiple departments. Mm -hmm. And if one of the feedback from the surveys is that they want cross-departmental training and cross-departmental work, then that might be a solution on how to create a sense of belonging because you're not just working in your silo but you're trying different things that that's my answer if anyone else has any suggestions jump in i see heidi you have a question there's there's other questions as well i see from satish you have several several questions as well that you may want to go through yeah very good Yes, uh, my question was just uh, what surprised you the most during this research? I mean, what came with complete surprise? I suppose there, there was many factors that we looked at, um, you know, and, and, and I suppose personally from listening to, like we, we interviewed a lot of people and, and there was a lot of um, agreement in, in the soft skills. And, and Heidi, you, 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 we spoke about it a lot, but there was, there was 15 or 18 of, of the interviewees and, and they were all talking about the soft skills and how important the soft skills were. And, and we've seen very little changes in the recruitment um, process in the two or three months that we've been working on this in the sense that nobody's, that they, they're all saying that they want soft skills, but uh, they're still hiring just for hard skills and, and the, the, the difficulties. I know that, that the markets are really only opening up and it will take a couple of months, but I suppose from what the experts are saying and, and at practical level, what's happening, that was the surprise in a negative way for us um, that it hasn't, hasn't kicked in uh, across the board. Um, that was definitely one, one issue that, that, uh, that stood out with us. There was an, probably another one, you know, not to hog it, Rev, but um, the differences, I suppose, between the different countries and, um, you know, uh, with the speed that it hit, everybody was was caught, I suppose, a little bit for the first lockdown and and they were better prepared for the second one. But there were still massive gaps in, in, in what they did and what they felt they, they could have done a bit more. Um, and certain countries that, you know, they, they, they didn't get the opportunity to offer as much as they would have uh, in, in terms of benefits and care for the, the employees. Um, so I suppose the variances was was quite uh, incredible, and that was surprising, unfortunately, in a, in a hu humanitarian point of view. Very good, thank you. I have um, so I just found out the Q and A chat. I didn't see it before, but I I, I think um, uh, Satish Pulpaka, who is is actually my cousin, <laughs> um, his <laughs> his his question and Laura's um. Are, are slightly similar in terms of um, how to attract fresh talent. And um, I, I think that there has been a lot of attrition, not by any fault other than COVID. And there are jobs we've been talking about all semester, how um, the customer experience and hospitality in general is going to become increasingly more important across all industries technology, consulting, you name it, because as AI and tech take over more of the skills, what is left are, is what we can contribute as, as humans and as, as well um, as people who can understand and read another person. By the minute they walk in, you sense their attitude, their stance, if they're in a good mood, a bad mood, this is going to be taken up by luxury brands, boutiques, you name it. Now, how to attract fresh talent is, I actually think we should go away the other way around. So 
I'm not saying this because I'm a former consultant, but I think that there are companies that do a very good job of including their workforce, regardless. Like hospitality seem, uh, departments are still very siloed. This goes back to cross department work. And I think that if we want to attract new talent, it'll be a combination of people coming in from leading hospitality schools, um, like where many of you went to, and people who have experience in strategy and operations, who can identify where gaps are within a hotel. And they might say, you know, okay, today we started this, um, we're trying this intergroup. Um, I mean, this is a very American thing, but at 5 p.m. when people get off work, I know this is not the case with hotels because it's round the clock, but in your free time, you don't have to run home. You can learn to spend time with your colleagues and actually have fun. Shouldn't be something that's forced upon you. It should be something that you want to do. And I think to retain and attract talent, you want to attract talent who want to meet other people and who want to become friends with the people that they work with. Um, so I named consulting as an example, but I think it could be coming from a lot of other places. It could be coming from startups. Not everyone who works in a startup is a techie. So startups by definition are people, small groups who really want to make a difference. So these are some industries where I think the reverse can happen and, and maybe hotels should be looking at those to attract talent. Now, the, sec the last question from Paul, from Paul um, is about the performance uh, new appraisals. That is going to require, require a lot to change because, sorry, um, because old metrics are required, I think, to some degrees, of course, we need to make sure that utilization is still being used, is still up to whatever standards, De depending on the department, um, RevPAR works, all the individual, there are metrics that should be in place, but that should be half of the appraisal. I, I, I think that the whole, that change management really does need to start at the top. And this is that last quote from, from Andrew saying, uh, maybe leadership is, is a bit outdated. And so this is where mindset change starts at the top. And then if you have a good leader, you follow the leader. Okay, and just, uh, I, I want to add, um, I, I interviewed Paul Moxness and, and we had a fabulous chat, Paul, and, and I appreciate your time. And um, I know you have a book that's coming out very soon, uh, Spin the Bottle Service, Hospitality in the Age of AI. And uh, I, I'll be following that closely. But, um, you know, we, we had an incredible chat and, and a lot of the things that uh, I suppose we were speaking about we went back to that and how we can, we can uh, the evaluation or the appraisal system could be improved and modified and make it more two-way and make it, make it less... Um, once a year, just coming in and, and trying to justify a pay rise and, and to make it more personable and make it uh, um, more uh, enriching, I suppose. So, uh, yeah. That's an, uh, another one there, Red. You have many questions in the panelists too. In the chat. Yeah, there seems in the chat, good. yes. We have one company from uh, Olga. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's saying, as companies are looking to cut down or merge positions and make the best of the workforce, uh, they have now realistic. Uh, how realistic do you think it is for a more human approach when, when, when this is happening? Maybe Rev or Demon? Well, I think this is where cross-departmental learning and trainings come in because, unfortunately, if you are going to, at least in the near term, um, downsize the people that you hire, you want to have, um, I wanna say plug and play, but multiple skills where they can jump in where needed. And and, and again, I'm, I, I've never worked in, in hospitality, but that is where my mind would go to is you use 
your staff, you train them across the board, not siloed, so they can help where needed until, of course, you can ramp up again. Dermot or we Heidi? Saw, or- yeah, and we saw an amazing amount of respondents that because they were on working on skeleton staff uh, for the last few months, if, if they were open while they were open, while they were open, closed, and, and, and it just became part of the new norm. People had to wear different hats and numerous hats and, and just roll up the sleeves and get involved and help out. And whether you're on reception and then you're, you're, you're working, helping out in the kitchen or, or doing different, different roles, it just became a lot more, um, you know, inclusive and, and everybody just had to help out. And, and, you know, it, it, I think it's a, it's an important part of the business that you'd, you'd hope that it'd be one of the things that happened in COVID that would follow on. Um, and, and, there would be an element of, of that kind of training that it'd be specifically done, maybe not with all staff, but would be specifically done throughout the year and, and to bring people out of their comfort zone and just expose them to another part of the business to give them a, a greater appreciation of how the hotel works and, and help with their own internal uh, ambitions, perhaps, to move up the, up the ladder. Um, I just have a quick question myself, actually, for Heidi. Um, Heidi, we spoke a couple of months ago and... and you know, you, you mentioned, again, I keep harping on about it, but for, from our studies, it was just one of the things that really came out and a lot of the students have, have, been, have been having difficulty with it. And the soft skills, and we spoke about how you done the video CD, and I'm just wondering uh, why more professionals like you, like you, 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 your company are obviously leaders in this, in this, in this industry. And, and I just want to wonder why more aren't following suit um, and will they know that everybody's a lot more comfortable with uh, Zoom and, and uh, Teams because of COVID? What was your, what's your own opinion on that? You were asking me why you think not more are taking the lead or follow our lead in this, right? Exactly. Using technology to have a two-minute uh, feel for a person and their personality um, and not just making the soft skills decision when it comes down to three people for the, the position and make it actually uh, a lot earlier in the recruitment process. Yes, maybe it's intimidating, you know, video, as soon as we hear video and we have to do recordings. I mean, of course, it, it brings extra work with, you know, the whole recruitment process, but we think it's a true asset. It accelerates the process. Why not many more are following? I just, you know, maybe still stuck a bit in the past. It's That's why I believe what we also all, I think, agree on. We have to think outside the box. We have to agree that this is now a new era of connections and that video, we are all... We, we, we want to see who is behind the CV. I hear so many frustrations from candidates that do not receive a response. They contact recruitment agencies. They want to apply with top companies and there's no response. You know, they've maybe even went through an interview process and they're not given a response. So it is time that we step up the process and uh, we're making a lot of noise about it. Why not many more are following? It's because I believe, you know, when, when you are so used to certain patterns, you know, it's hard to transmute them and uh, dissolve and realize that you have to move on from it. And uh, so it's time that we, we all do it and we have to set an example. But why are you not doing it yet? I think even LinkedIn now is starting, you know, you can have a little intro on LinkedIn profile. Not yet, not everyone yet is using it i think it comes there more peu a peu yeah. I so i am um... important especially there's maybe not for every industry but i definitely think for our industry it's, it's so vital um the okay. personality is a massive part of it absolutely so keep doing it I, you're, you're doing a great job so keep spreading the word if i if i can if i can add to what id said you know it, it's true it's a question of habit as well but having been in hr having being you know director of hr for for a cruise line we are trained in certain ways and, and it's very also reassuring to use the methods that we've always used. You know, it's very reassuring from a compliance standpoint to look at the CV and being able to make a decision on the CV because we perceive that as being objective uh, because it's based on something, on something real, right? So it's, it's reassuring for your brain to make a decision based on what you see on the CV. Yet, I agree, you know, we should change that and understand that we are in an hospitality where the soft skill, the person, is, is more important. Not so much the experience. The experience matters, but, you know, you can train on the experience. We should really, but it's difficult. You know, it's difficult. Even me, like, for example, I say, well, when I, when I used to interview people, you know, you get your CV, 
it's very difficult. I used to have a practice, which is that I put the CV, I put it on the side, but physically with my hand, I put it on the side and I say, okay, talk to me, you know? And then I look at the CV, but it's difficult to do that because yeah, it's, it's very, oh yeah, it's a CV, oh, no, it doesn't fit, you know? So it's a question of changing habits of people, expert, like you said, they're not, but who are not really expert, who are just people that are used to work a certain way because that way worked before and because that way is reassuring Safe. that way is also faster sometimes you know the easy way is the is the path we take and that's wrong you know in many ways so i admire as far as i'm concerned people such as id and others as well but id is, is a prime example i admire people that say you know what no we're going to change that and we are going to really focus on what truly matters if we want to change the industry if we want to um, to really make this industry even better than it was before. And I, for one, believe that we will make this industry better than it was before. But we need people like Heidi. And we need people like you guys, you know, to change us. <laughs> We're still trying. Peter, do you know what to add? I'm looking through here. I cannot see any uh, more questions. Um, just a quick insight that I got from one of the interviews that I conducted and that which I also think is very uh, much aligned to what we have been talking about uh, these, these, these past moments is uh, this, this person mentioned that with the industry changing so much uh, and having to adapt to new roles uh, and working in cross departments, um, Specifically, this person said that it's difficult to recruit people that have been in the industry for a long time because they're used to do things in a certain way. And I think they're saying that there's an old, it's, it's hard to train an old dog to, to do something different. Uh, so this person specifically said that for certain roles or for uh, to future uh, improve the hotels or the chains that this person was working in, they are looking for young people that, that have a fresh mind and that are able and eager to take on new challenges with the new perspective um, and maybe even come to a conclusion or a goal or a solution faster than having to relearn uh, and recalibrate what people already learn. So that was just a quick uh, and I think maybe insightful. Uh, it's a very good point, Peter. I have uh, another another um, thing to add to that, and, and I, su I suppose because of COVID, managers have had to step out of their their bubble a little bit, um, and they've had to try and communicate on a deeper level with employees. They've asked about their wives, their kids, their 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 partners, um, and, and they've gone beyond the professional kind of official communication that they've had with their team members. Do you think? Now that managers have had this, um, I suppose, training in a sense that they, that they, that it's something that they will use going forward or is it just a crisis type management style that they say, OK, we park that to the side. I'm going to get back now just to being that manager with my barriers between me and my staff or, or will they embrace that culture and that um, inclusiveness, I suppose? Have you any thoughts on that, Heidi or Bertrand? Heidi? Uh, yes, I wanted to add on to the mindset we were talking about, you know, how can we ignite change? And I believe it always starts with a growth mindset. You know, we have a personality, but we need to understand no matter how old you are, you can change. You know, of course, it's good to bring in uh, the, the new generation. And sometimes it's also good to, good to let go and just retire and enjoy life or move on to something else. But we can change because Dr. Cho Dispenza says, you know, our personality is you know, very much influenced by our environment, the people we choose around us, but also it really, our habit and behavior, you know, it, it all builds around our feelings, our thoughts and what we say. So we, we can change when we change, we have to start changing our thoughts, feelings, and that will then produce a different behavior. And if we keep doing it, um, we can ignite change. And so it, I really believe it's a, it's a mind, mindset. It's a mindset question. Leave that too. Good answer. Bertrand? 
Okay. No, no, it's, it's I, I like what you said, idea about having a growth mindset. And Dermot, I think, you know, don't lose hope. You know, you will have no. people that will go back uh, the way uh, they worked before. And that's okay, you know, and you will have people that will understand that, no, maybe I, I need to change. And also that change is good, you know. And, and, and it does, it does, it does work. You know, I've, I've seen, for example, in my example, uh, you know, a few months ago, my, my, my friend and, and, and business partner Lilian said, okay, Bertrand, you should, you should do podcasts. You know, the, I was sort of launched on the idea of, I didn't even know what it was, you know, and it was like, I even had, if you ask him, I even had difficulty for weeks in, in understanding what a podcast is. And I would, I would mix podcast, webinar, whatever, you know, I, I would say webinar, it was a podcast, whatever. But, you know, he, he sort of forced me and not just with that, but with many other things, because we're different generations. No, I'm not that old, but we're different generations. And he, he works in a way, he pushes me. So if, you know, an old dog like me can change and do things differently and you do the same, you know, the, the beauty of it is when I'm in front of you guys in, in class, you change me, you know. And I think this is about having a growth mindset is, is understanding that we need to change. We need to constantly learn, evolve. And either we take it and we move forward, we go with it. And hopefully that's a good lesson. That's what we, the majority of people will do. Or some people might say, I don't want it. You know, it's not for me. But those people will not redefine the tourism industry. Those people will be left behind, I guarantee you. You know, and people such as you or such as Lilian will be the ones that will drive the industry forward in the future. Uh, so... You will have a little bit of both, and that's okay. You know? Yeah, that's true. I suppose it will go that way. And empathy is going to be such an important uh, yeah. player in emotional intelligence that you were speaking about, Rev, earlier on in the presentation. Like they're, they're, they're and, key. And, I, and I want to add something. Also, you're right. You know, you use a lot of great words, and I think they're all very, uh, very, uh, very strong and very powerful. I would like to add a word as well, uh, which is authenticity. I think people, yeah. especially with the new generation, right, they will look, we spoke about it with Heidi a few days ago, a couple of days ago, um, people will look for authenticity today, and especially in our industry, you know, to have scripted standards when you come in a hotel today doesn't work, right? Um, it's it, People want authenticity. People want to feel that they are genuinely welcome let's say in a hotel or, or on a cruise ship or whatever, and it's not scripted, it's not. So I think also when you talk about recruitment today, one word I'd like to add is we need also as HR professionals to show that authenticity, you yes. know, to show transparency and authenticity in the way we deal with people. We're humans, we make mistakes, it's okay. You know, I might not call back every candidate that I, that I uh, interviewed and, and that's okay, I make a mistake, you know. But as long as you're authentic about it, you're, you're, you show that you're a human person with your failures, with your successes, and, and that you just do that because you're, you have a passion for it. And that's authenticity, you know? And that's important, you know, also in, in including authenticity in our human resources methodology, I think is, is critical as well. And that's what, you know, people like Heidi do, but it takes, mm, uh, it doesn't take work. I'm not going to say it takes work. It takes work, but it takes discipline. Discipline, and also it, it it's it takes you know character. You know, it's also your character. You know, are you an authentic person? Are you someone that truly believes? That truly, you you, you know, guys, how I, when I talk about cruise ships in in the class, I have my eyes that go like bright, and and you know, I feel like I'm feel the ship moving again, right? Well, you know, that's that's what you want. And I think hopefully you enter a career where you, you're going to be able to express that. You have to do that. You have to go into a career because you absolutely love it. And that's being authentic to yourself. You know, I've made a mistake several times to, and, and even recently, you know, to go sometimes into industries or jobs where I did it because it was cool, because it was prestigious, because it was, but it wasn't me. It wasn't authentic, you know, and then you regret it very fast, very fast. So the ability of HR managers to decipher, to find out authenticity in their candidates is going to be, in my opinion, the one critical key for success. You know, are you authentic to work in this business? If not, I don't care. You might have the biggest uh, 
expertise well of course expertise is important sometimes you need to factor this in but you know if you don't have authenticity if you're not an authentic person that you you don't really show that you're passionate about what you're going to do in, in our industry you know what yeah exactly like, like ref said like ref said you know maybe there are other industries you you might you might excel in you know i think i think we're a little bit out of time <laughs> I, I wanted I wanted to I wanted before you do a closing statement I'm sure you have a very nice closing statement uh, prepared but um, I, I wanted to also uh, well thank the university uh, the University of Monaco for their support for also uh, first and foremost for recruiting you guys in the master of luxury hospitality um, because they've done a very good job uh, and you've done a good job of course after that uh working you've worked very hard but thank you to the university thank you for your program director and Annalisa and Sophie de Lorenzo and Marine as well because I believe Marine has helped uh, also with the webinar and Camille and the whole team at the University of Monaco uh, for their support for their promotion and and for for getting you guys into a classroom together right that was we had uh, we had an amazing year together and uh, so thank you for this and now to your closing statement. By the way, at the end, we will stop the recording. Our guest, thank you very much for attending this, this important uh, webinar. I hope you learned. We will uh, distribute uh, the final report. You can contact any of us like, uh, like the team just uh, mentioned in their, in their thank you uh, slide. We will be very happy to share the findings with you because this was obviously a very brief overview of their work. Uh, but uh, I'm sure uh, that the, the report is, is contains a lot of information. So we'll be very happy to share that with you. Uh, but at the end, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll uh, say goodbye to you. I would love to have Rev, Dermot, Peter, and the entire uh, team, uh, all the students that are part of the call to remain online. So we can uh, do a little debrief after. So remain online. You can cut obviously the video, not the video, sorry, the recording, but let's remain online. Up to you guys for your closing statement. I, I just want to personally thank Heidi and, and for everybody that helped um, make this possible. Um, there was a lot of interviews. There was a lot of time spent. And, um, you know, we, we all had plenty of other things on. And, um, but, it, but it was really a, a fabulous experience. And we were exposed, thanks to you, Bertrand, we were exposed to some incredible people. Um, and... and uh, I, I suppose it, it, that's what it was about. It was just, you know, meeting and getting that exposure and, and getting getting stuck into a project that um, had so much to give. And the more that we dug, the, the, the more that we found. And, and um, it was a great experience. I truly enjoyed it. Um, and Heidi, thanks a million. Uh, you've been fantastic from start to finish. And uh, I wish you uh, continued uh, success in, in everything that you are doing. You're, you're you're doing a fantastic job and keep going, you know. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Dermot, I think you said it perfectly. And everyone else who has helped us and may not have been able to join uh, because it is either very late or very early, um, they've all been kind enough to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, just for advice, it might not even be job related, but uh, just helping us along as we as we graduate and look for stuff over the next few months. So couldn't have done it without uh, without your help, uh, Bertrand, uh, Heidi, and uh, and Lilian. If you Lillian, you just yeah. online or absolutely shut off. So thank you very much. Great, just as a short, uh, everybody that participated today, we have your emails. So we will be sending out the, the report, uh, hopefully by the end of, of this week. Uh, and if there's anyone else that you know that maybe wants the presentation or the report, then you just uh, send an email to the emails that are provided on this last slide. Perfect. Report by Sunday. Yes.
Yeah, let's give. Uh, we'll give you guys. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Give you, exam. <laughs> then you, you, you had you had a hard day. I gave you your final exam this morning. Then you had this presentation today. You guys must be exhausted. I think you guys deserve some champagne, right? <laughs> it was a fun day. It was. I wouldn't say a fun day. Well, maybe. I don't know. Sure. Anyway, thank you for the audience. We're going to say thank goodbye you. to everybody. Please, the IUM team, uh, remain online. Heidi, you're more than welcome to remain online if you want to, or though you may have something else to do, but you're welcome to stay online. I'd like to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you again for participating to this webinar. Thank you for the support to the IUM students, and um, I hope to see you very soon again. So bye-bye to everybody. And again, we stay online. We can stop the recording. We stay online. We